ladies and gentlemen today it is my privilege to welcome to the channel the original and current drummer of one of the most mental bands to have ever come out of manchester gaz <laughs> whelan drummer for the happy mondays welcome hi james nice one just want to say first i'm not being a potential with these things behind me, yeah, it's just I'm staying at my mum's because I live in Canada and she put them on the wall in the bedroom. There's no one else to sit. Looks mint. It looks mint. <laughs> so, um, Gaz, tell us the story of how you came to join the Happy Mondays in the very earliest days. I'm younger, a lot younger than the rest of them. I was uh, I was at school, I was 15, and uh, in my class of school was a girl called Bev. And Nigel was a lad called Nigel. Nigel had an older brother called Mark Day, who was like six years older. And Bev had an older sister who was about five, six years older, who was marrying this lad called Sean Ryder. And they were both saying, they've got this band and they need a drummer. There's only three of them. There's Paul Ryder, Sean Ryder and Mark Day. And, it was, and I'd, I'd, I bought a drum kit. We went to form a band at school. And so they invited me down. I got coerced to go down to a rehearsal. And they were just starting out. They were called Avant Garde at the time, which is a terrible name. And I just went and sat in them because I dressed the same as Paul and Sean. I, I, they just said, oh, come in, you know, and that was it. And, and we joined. I was 15. But I always felt a bit bit of an outsider. And then when I met the two Ryder brothers, I was like, oh, they're like me. But yeah, I just felt home straight away. And I got on with me and Paul hit it off straight away. And we just became best mates until you know, he died a couple of weeks ago, you know. Well, that's, of course, something we have to touch on. Absolutely tragic. And a lot of us were, were gutted to hear the news. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't the healthiest person, but still, you know, I was out last Saturday and I, and I went to text him. He said, he texted us, I was just texting Horse, was his nickname, Horse, and he went, what are you doing? I was like, oh. you know, he was the laziest laid-back man he had made in my life. He never broke a sweat. But on stage, you, you'd make the slightest mistake or do something a little bit too flash and you'd look over and he was on it. He was on you straight away. And, you, you know, you never, you knew he was watching all the time. And he was on that stage. He was, he was obsessive. He was a heavy drinker, heavy heroin user, you know, we got, and he was serious, you know, a lot more than any, anybody else in the band. He was a kind of a, but, he, but he'd been clean for 15, 20 years. He'd done really well. If, if you'd rather not, that's completely fine. Um, but I was wondering, maybe you might share one of your happiest memories of you and Paul in your time in the band. <laughs> that tons. You know, look, the thing is, it's kind of, we we became that close. It was one of them, like an old couple. We richly could read each other's mind, and we had a very similar sense of humour. The two funniest people I've ever met in my life was Paul Ryder and Paul Davis, the keyboard player. I remember saying to him when I, when I first joined the band, he was a couple of years older than me, why don't you smoke? Because everyone smoked cigs then in the year eight. He says, why don't you smoke? And he said, oh, all that backwards and forwards with the elbow. He said, you know, it just seems like too much exercise to me. Anyway, he started smoking about a year later and, caught, and he never stopped, you know, and, and, that, and it kind of hit us. We was driving home from Edinburgh last weekend and Mark Daly leaned over to me in the van and said, I miss not stopping every half hour for Paul for his cigarette. And we kind of both got a bit upset. And that, it kind of hits in them times, you know what I mean? And What was his last gig with the band? Was it the Isle of Wight? Yeah, which I didn't do because I was in Canada. I couldn't get out of Canada. I couldn't get out of Canada at the time, so I didn't do that gig, which is... I know. Yeah, I, there's one gig I didn't do, one gig I didn't do this year. Didn't realise that. It's just dawned on me that, yeah. I didn't play the last gig with him. It's funny because, yeah, he just sent an email saying, you know, what, are you going to get, because I couldn't get out of Canada. Are you going to you gonna come? I love you. I miss you. You know, come on, you make sure you make it for the next gig. And obviously I did, and then he didn't. Yeah, bloody hell. I didn't realise that. It's just dawned on me that was his last gig. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I suppose it's probably too early to know what you guys are going to do going forward, or, or have you decided anything at all about, We've done three or four gigs, um, and Mikey plays in, who, who, who played before, he, he jumped in. He's a very different bass player than Paul, but he jumped in, and you just like the Stones with Charlie Watcher. And the thing is about without Watcher sound like Freddie Mercury, you know, the show, you know, show must go on. And Paul was really much like that. He was when it comes to the music, he was, you know, yeah. I mean, I suppose that that does seem to line up with Paul's character that he would absolutely want the show to go on. Without a doubt. And I'm not trying to make, you know, sometimes people say to make themselves feel better, but no, he really would. He really would. He really would. So I understand it's probably quite raw, but just, I was wondering, has it come out? What actually happened with Paul? Was it primarily just burning the candle twice as bright at both ends for a lifetime? Ha what, what happened? I think it's probably a combination of a lot of things. I don't, I, I don't really, I really, honestly, the genuine answer is I don't know. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Right. But he wasn't in it great his shape. He was he's diabetic. He's he smoked a lot. You know, uh and he never broke a sweat in his life. <laughs> you know, yeah. My mum and Mrs. Ryder have a rock and roll rock and roll Wednesday night where they get together and drink. Uh, and they've done it for 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. And they never miss. So I said, uh, ring Linda, his mum, Lynn, Lynn, bring uh, Mrs. Ryder and ask how he is. This is at midnight, because I'm worried about him. 
So she rang him, Linda got back to him. He's snoring. So he was fine then. He was alive then, you know. So I don't know how, how but by the morning he, he, he died. So we don't know. So really, so the answer is I don't know. We don't know. Right. But so he, he did pass away peacefully in his sleep then? Yeah, that's that's kind of what happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, in a sense, that's a relief. That's nice to know, you know, that's... Yeah, that's... he died in his sleep. Yeah, basically, so... Right. Well, th- I appreciate you sharing that, man. Thank you. It's funny, I was in the, I went to the pub last night. I said, I went to the pub and I went, they said, I said, I'm only having two because I said, I've got a, a podcast tomorrow morning and I don't want to be hung over. And they went, uh, who is it with? So I said your name and, and both of them went, oh, the guy who does the Oasis stuff. I saw him at that Water Axe gig when they were, just before they were signed or when they were signed. So we went down and watched. And I remember watching him thinking, wow, that, what, that was great. What a great band. But I remember saying after John Bryce, I said, what do you think? I said, you were brilliant. You know, great. Everything about him was great. I said, the only negative is that I said it, are they too Mancunian? You know, is it too close to the Manchester thing having him? Will that go against him? And that's what, and I really thought, and I thought, are people going to accept him because they're just too Manchester and it's it's too close to what's just gone? Mm. And I was wrong. You know, I was completely wrong. The songs overrode all that, you know. That's really interesting. So you guys were kind of connected with Oasis right from the start. And I know you guys supported them at their probably most infamous gig, which was Wembley in the year 2000. Now, I haven't been able to find any footage of this, but loads of people have commented that Sean basically did a lot of the gig as an as an Elvis impersonation. And um and that Liam just was like smashed and just kind of wandered on stage halfway through the Monday set. We 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 just jammed in rehearsals Suspicious Minds for a bit of fun. And in between the songs, we just started playing Suspicious Minds. And then Sean just started singing it. And I remember Liam was at the side of the stage and looked over and he went, Yes, Elvis. They're the the moments that make gigs different, you know, rather than everything being polished and spot on. And I watched him the other night. I didn't watch him that night, Oasis, but I think that was the night when he was being a bit controversial. I don't know what he did or what he said, but I didn't watch him that night. When I was living in London, we went down. uh, Noel used to have a guitar tech from Yorkshire called Jason. Do you know know Jason? Jason Rhodes. And we was in Hills Court. went to the vintage guitar shop in Hills Court. And uh, I think it was me, Noel, Jason and Spot from Proud Mary. We were walking around and uh, the guy came up and it was uh, guitars, 30, 40, 50 grand guitars. I mean, really, you know, really expensive guitars. And Noel said uh, to Jason, I'll... uh, let me just get that one, ask him to get that one down, that one and that one, put three guitars out, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll check them out. I'm just going to go and have a look at basses. And he went off and the guy came and Jason said, can no, I'll have a look at that one, that one and the third one. And the bloke started laughing. And Jason and said, what are you laughing at? And Jason went, I know why he's laughing. And I went, why? And he went, the third one is Noel's guitar. I'm selling it for him. <laughs> he didn't even, he's not got that many guitars. He didn't even know. That's his, his that guitar he wants to have a look at. It's his guitar. He's sat, I'm selling it for him. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about the gig you did with Oasis, but what was for you the greatest Happy Mondays gig of all time? You know what? For me, I, I mean, obviously Ellen Road and we did Leeds and we sold out of football ground. I was like, wow, you know, that 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 probably was it. Uh, or probably the first GMEX one. But the one I remember was we did Rock in Rio in 90, 91, I think it was. And we it was American Island Stadium, so like, and it was hundred and five thousand people. We wandered on stage, and we imagine the state we was in in South America. It'd been raining all weekend, and the heavens opened about five minutes into the opening song. The heavens opened, and we carried on playing. And they say, "Come on stage, come on stage!" You get electrocuted, and we were just completely off our nuts. So we were just, oh, we carried on, and because the crowd saw that we didn't leave the stage like a real band, they kind of went, "Oh, they warmed to us." And then that was it. So that was a great gig. Ronnie Biggs had signed me tracksuit bottoms. The water was dripping. And I kept trying to move my foot when I was playing drums so that he didn't, didn't wash it off. Something I wanted to ask you about, which I've been trying to research, and there's so little information out there, is Glastonbury in 1990. Now, <laughs> now, from what I've heard, the just chaos that came with the Happy Mondays when you guys rolled up to Glastonbury in 1990 was the reason the festival was cancelled the following year and the reason that they put up metal fencing around the outside from that point onwards. Do you remember much about that? My wife, whom we've today, we just met. And now we weren't together. She was uh, living in Italy and she was over, but her sister was married to Andy Rourke, the bass player from the Smiths. So they'd come down for the day and they weren't staying. They were going to drive home after the gig. So I said, oh, I'll jump in with you and come back and go back to... They lived in Burnage, ironically. We'll go back to Burnage. I remember getting off the tour bus and like all coaches, your luggage is underneath, you know, you have your thing. And I lifted the luggage in and there was actually a, a couple in there. 
uh, getting very intimate. In they'd gone in there to find some guy, and I was just like, "Give me, me give me my bag." And I remember just thinking, that, that was, you know, it was crazy. And uh, yeah. and that was that's all I can remember. And then I, because I left, I left about two or three in the morning, so I didn't stay over at the night, so I didn't know what everything what, what what went on after that. So I wasn't privy to it, so I can't really say. But yeah, we'd been banned for a long time, so uh, I think we did it again since then. I think we did it in two thousand and one. So I think maybe, maybe not. I can't remember. But we're allowed back in now. Yeah, our bands up. <laughs> You've done your time. We've done our time, yeah. Do you know of any footage of Glastonbury 90 or of you guys doing your support of Oasis at Wembley? I haven't been able to find a thing. We're not very good like that. We don't document anything. Or People have this image that we used to, we'd saw Europe, we used to bounce into the city being really loud, like football hooligans, complete opposite. But with organic trouble would just follow us. Things just followed us. Things just ensued and <laughs> always, always. Something happened always. Was it true that at Glastonbury, um, 1990, one of your entourage, one of the group, took the <laughs> took the backstage pass and made like 2,000 copies and brought like this mob of people from Manchester who just swamped the backstage yeah. area? You know, but all bands used to do that, used to get copies of backstage passes. I remember we used to always, when we used to get our passes, we used to all give them out. So I'll bring them back to get people in. So probably... So there's probably some truth to it, but like most things of us, there's some truth to it, but not, you know, not as it wasn't as bad as what, what it was made out to be. We weren't, we weren't that bad. A lot of my viewers won't know that. There is a Gaz Whelan book coming out. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's me being five years younger than the rest of them, is, and uh, it's kind of my point of view because being the drummer at the back and then growing up younger and then being the influences on me. It's a coming-of-age story, the first, the first part of it. But I learned not to get in. I never got into class A's because I saw, you know, I learned a lot from it. There's lots of stories about what I saw in the early days in this one, as we were we were really close. We were really, really close. And we were we, we were poor and really close, had no money. And just some of the escapades we got up to. It should be finished by the end of the year and then put it on next year. But I don't I do do some acoustic songs to go with it. I'm not sure. We'll see. But I'm gonna do like I'm I'm gonna do an acoustic tour in November, December. I'll do electric set for half an hour and then a, a sit down a Q and A and some acoustic Monday songs. And I've got a, a friend from Toronto, from Burnage, Shay Coates, who's Liam's his godfather. Uh, he's a singer songwriter, so he's going to support as well. So that's going to be the end of November, early December. So Gaz, you've kindly agreed to share with us a unfinished version of a single that's going to be coming out in October in advance of your November, December tour. What's that song called? Uh, it's called Black Symphony, and it's kind of a bit of... <laughs> it's a song of regret, of course it is. I'll send you a clip of it, uh, what I've got. It's just a guide vocal. It's not finished, but, you know, so I'll send you a clip. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time, mate. It's been fantastic to meet you, and I look forward to hearing some of your stuff out on tour. Intoxicate to try locate Tomorrow's scene It's a mundane scene Just an empty dream Our naked love and hollow words Are just a curse Are the gods perverse Do they watch us hurt? Give me my time, I want it again My broken you the hopeless fool I represent He's gone tomorrow So give me my life I want it to spend The golden years were only lent The golden rules you always bent I'll beg for sorrow Take me down Take me down Take me down 